lessons of being a preacher is following other preachers around. And I mentioned when I introduced Denver uh, the other night that uh, he had preached in my home county and knew all of my relatives. <laughs> but uh, then I followed him in a work when we were in St. Mary's. And uh, when Eddie found out that I was moving there, he said, look for my initials in the carved in the wall on the, the third floor. <laughs> well, I looked, but I couldn't find them. <laughs> so I presume he was kidding. <laughs> but uh, uh, Eddie and I have been good friends ever since we became acquainted. We worked together in youth camps and uh, uh, shared a lot of good times together. And while we were in central Ohio, we were within, I guess, about 50 miles of each other and uh, saw each other periodically. And uh, we've had a good relationship through the years. We're glad that he has just recently moved to the North End Congregation in Parkersburg, where he will be even closer to us. And uh, hopefully, uh, in time to come, we'll be able to be uh, of help to us in the school. But uh, uh, he is... Uh, the son of Denver and Florence Cooper, and married to Barbara, Barbara Buckley. They have two sons, Jason, age 24, and Scott, 18. He graduated from St. Mary's High School, attended uh, the uh, Ohio Valley College, and then got his bachelor's degree from Abilene University. Uh, he has served as a local preacher in Ohio, West Virginia, Texas, and uh, currently in Parkersburg. He's preached in a lot of gospel meetings and in great demand for meetings. In fact, uh, since he's moved to Parkersburg about a month ago, I don't know if he's got one Sunday in yet. I think one Sunday. <laughs> so, uh, but he is uh, uh, a preacher that is uh, in demand because of his preaching of the truth and the stand that he takes for truth and righteousness and upholding the ways of God everywhere he goes. And we're glad to have him on our program this morning. Our theme is Jesus the Christ, and we have asked him to speak on the subject of what Jesus said about heaven. And I'm sure that he will have some good things from the Bible to tell us. Could. That's an honor itself. A few weeks ago, I was in a meeting at uh, St. Mary's. Brother Dan Kessinger got a lot of mileage out of the fact that I was the preacher in absentia. Uh, but anyway, uh, these, these preachers have really gotten the mileage out of my not being at uh, North End since I was hired. The first week I was at North End, Brother Roger Rush held us a meeting, so that canceled out one Sunday. The second Sunday I held a meeting at St. Mary's, and the third Sunday I was there, I preached. And this past Sunday I was at New Comerstown, Ohio, in a meeting, but this Sunday I will be at North End in case you want to come. Uh, I will be there. As a matter of fact, one of the elders came last night, and I suppose he's probably checking up to see if I made it back to my meeting. I don't know. But anyway, we're glad to be here. I appreciate the work of the school and for the invitation of being with you during this uh, series of lectureships. I've been unfortunate not being able to attend every session, which I could have, but due to uh, my meeting schedule was not able to attend uh, but a few of the lectures, but I've appreciated everything that's been said thus far. Uh, the lectures have been excellent and appreciate everything that all of you have done in preparation for the lectureship and those who have spoken th thus far. Brother Pugh asked me yesterday, he said, I don't understand this. He said, uh, every time you speak on a lectureship, he said, they give you the subject of heaven. Uh, he said, you just spoke on that not too long ago. And I said, well, I'm going there, and I'm just trying to get the rest of you to go too. <laughs> so I guess I'm the only one qualified to speak on it. I don't know. Several years ago uh, in lectureships, they gave me, uh, uh, I think it was three lectures, dealing with denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, I have that memorized because I gave three lectures on it. 
And someone asked me how I got that topic all the time, and I said, I guess they thought I was a one who knew more about than anyone else. And so uh, uh, that happens at times, I guess. This morning we're going to discuss together a subject that I'm hoping that all of you are uh, interested in, or you wouldn't be here. It is a subject of sublime importance, and it is one that I always uh, love to talk about. And I hope that your interest is keen in going to heaven. I've often said in meetings and in lessons that I have determined a long time ago that in life I'm not going to let anyone or anything deter me from going to heaven. And I hope that you feel the same way. Heaven has to do more uh, than with uh, gates and walls and foundations and a street of gold. It has to do with people. When we think of all of life, there are those that uh, many of us can recall that have been our grandmothers or grandfathers, uncles and aunts, mothers or fathers, brothers or sisters that we have dearly loved. Individuals that in life have gone from this life to the next that we really miss. There is an absence there and we miss them. There are events and occurrences in life that we have cherished with those that we have loved, those that we miss. Memories that will never ever be forgotten, they will always be cherished. And so when we think of all of these things in many inestimable ways, there are those who have really touched our lives. The Walt mentioned a while ago that my grandfather was an elder at the North End Church, and it seems like we've come full circle, at least I, I hope that people will help me in that. We have a lot of uh, uh, shoes to fill. But when we realize those who have gone before us and all the great works and great achievements that they have uh, accomplished, been able to accomplish, uh, they have really added to our lives in many ways. They have blessed our lives. When we think of individuals whose uh, lives have drawn us closer to our Heavenly Father, we can probably think of uh, many people, uh, elders perhaps and preachers, mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers, uncles and aunts and so on, who have because of their relationship drawn us closer to our Heavenly Father and desired more than anything else that we would go to heaven and be with them and be with our Heavenly Father. All of my grandparents were grandly, uh, godly uh, grandparents, and they were always a source of encouragement. And their lives, when I was younger and got uh, into the teen years, were always a source of encouragement to help to draw my life into a closer relationship with my Heavenly Father. I'm thankful that I've had a Christian father and mother who have been a tremendous influence and example in my life. All of us can recall individuals that we have known or maybe know now who have that tremendous relationship to God and really want to go to heaven more than anything else in all the world. You know that's the way it ought to be. We ought to have those who have the drive and the stamina and the confidence that they're on their way to heaven, and they're not going to let anything deter them in reaching that eternal destiny. There is a song, I think, in this song book that is entitled, Oh, I Want to See Him, and I'd like to begin this morning with reading those words. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many eras pierce my soul, and from without within... But my Lord leads me on, and through him I must win. When in service for my Lord, dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to him. He will give me light. Satan's snares may vex the soul, turn my thoughts aside. But my Lord goes ahead, leads whate'er betide. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain height, and behold my Savior there leading in the fight, with a tender hand outstretched toward the valleys low, Guiding me, I can see as I onward go. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep, then my Lord directs my bark. He doth 
safely keep, and he leads me gently on through this world below. He's a real friend to me. Oh, I love him so. Oh, I want to see him. I want to look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. If you have your New Testaments, there is a passage that you are quite familiar with, I'm sure, which is found in Matthew 7. And we'll start reading in verse 21 of the text. And here's what the Bible says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. When we think of this passage, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In discussing matters with individuals, as has already been indicated, the Bible talks not only about heaven, but it also talks about the fear of hell and his punishment. When you look at all the words of Jesus, you will notice in Scripture that both heaven and hell were very real to Jesus. I don't, I don't sense in my study of Scriptures where this was something that Jesus just conjured up in his mind or his imagination just to have something to say. But it was something that was very real. And I really believe that in our world today, perhaps we don't show people the reality of heaven as well as the reality of hell. But Jesus talked about both of those, and he spoke about both of those. So that he was interested and concerned about our being wise builders, building upon a solid foundation so that ultimately we can get to heaven. Jesus emphasized that this world is for a reason. It exists for a reason, or several reasons. One in particular is the care that we take for our soul. You remember in Matthew 6, that lengthy passage that describes and ends with, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He discusses several phrases, and in each of those he says, which of you, by taking thought, for instance, can add one cubit to his stature? And he talks about the fowls of the air, the birds of the air, and how that God uh, takes care of them, and the lilies of the field, and so on. And he discusses all the things of this world. But the most important thing that he discusses is the care of the soul. The care of the soul. So while we're in this time world, we need to be concerned about the caring of our souls so that we can prepare it for eternity and especially heaven. Secondly, another reason for our existence is that we build up the kingdom. If we really understood, I think, the relationship that we're to have with our Heavenly Father and the importance of the kingdom, we would do all that we could to build it up. Matthew chapter 5 discusses the fact that we are to be lights in, in a dark, darkened world. We're to be uh, like a city that's set on a hill and cannot be hid. We're to be a leavening influence in the lives of other people, a preserving power by the use of uh, his word salt. And so we're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world and to make sure that all that we do in life is for the benefit of those who are in the kingdom, to build them up and to encourage and strengthen them. You know, if we really want to go to heaven, we will not tear down or try to destroy the kingdom of our Lord. We will be so concerned about those whose souls are lost that we are not self-centered, but we're interested in showing them the way to heaven. And then thirdly, we prepare for eternity. What we sow we reap. That's been mentioned several times in this lectureship. 
And so if we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we shall reap life everlasting. Individuals in our world say, well, I want to uh, sow my wild oats while I'm young and get it all out of my system. And they don't realize that time is very brief. It's running out. So this morning, as we study together, I want to try to help us to understand more than anything else the reality of heaven. Jesus spoke of the reality of heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that the Father's home was a a home that was full of spacious dwelling places. In John, the 14th chapter, in verse uh, 2, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus always told the truth. I don't have any reason to doubt that when Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a place for you, that he did. And that place is a real place. It's not something that individuals uh, speak on just to have something to say, but it is something that is real. It's something that we can cling to and hold on to. I know without any shadow of a doubt that heaven is a real place for a prepared people. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke with authority because he had been there. In John chapter 1, these are verses that you are acquainted with as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, this Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, now notice, full of grace and full of truth. Everything that Jesus uttered was truth. And so when he says, I have gone to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also, he spoke the truth. And so when I tell individuals that I'm on my way to heaven, I speak the truth. In lessons in the past, I've always tried to indicate this, and someone told me this a long time ago, and it's helped me, and I hope that it will help you. Hope involves two things. Hope involves, number one, desire. And secondly, it involves expectation. In the first place, I desire to go to heaven. And number two, I expect to get to heaven. Now you take away desire or you take away expectation. What do you have? Nothing. And so we have a hope that is sure and steadfast. It is the anchor of the soul. It's strong and it's steadfast and we need to continue uh, having that one hope that is provided for us through the pages of inspiration Jesus left the glories of heaven and came to the earth to die on the cross but as brother Pugh mentioned the other day it didn't end there and aren't we glad that it didn't end there But Jesus was able to overcome. He did not remain dead. But he was raised victorious from the dead. And as a result of that, we're able to be raised. The passage that he studied with you the other day, I wanted to include today because I think it's very paramount to our study. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I'm just going to read two verses for us. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. If we could just somehow uh, teach people the seriousness and the consequences of sin, maybe heaven would uh, be more important to them. I know I've failed in my lifetime trying to uh, express in my life the seriousness and the consequences of sin. And I think if somehow we could try to indicate to people that Christ died for our sins, it was a serious matter when Jesus left heaven and came to the earth to die for our sins. But it didn't stop there. He was buried in the tomb, and he was raised again the third day, the Bible says, according to the Scriptures, just as God had planned. And so when Jesus left heaven and came to the earth and died on the cross, he came to bring 
to man and declare to man the reality and the glories of heaven. And so I hope that we will continue to teach that. The term heaven occurs well over 100 times in four uh, in the four gospel accounts. And in the majority of those times when the word heaven is used, it comes from the lips of Jesus. So it must have been an important topic for Jesus. Yes, Jesus talked about its reality. Secondly, Jesus taught that heaven is a place. Among the fascinating contrasts that Jesus employed in his teachings is the one that he urged his disciples to lay up treasures not upon the earth. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. I like to use this illustration. It's a very simple one. Most of the men here probably can relate to it. I know that I've had this happen to me. You're driving your automobile down the highway and all of a sudden you hear all the squeaks and the bangs and the rattles and you begin noticing all the rust and everything is beginning to fall apart on your automobile. And you try to convince your wife that you need to go down to the automo de uh, automotive uh, dealership to look at some new, autom uh, new automobile. And you go into the uh, automobile dealership and you look at those new and fancy cars and isn't it nice to sit in one of those new cars and smell the newness? of a car, that fresh smell. The other day I was in one that had leather in it, and I thought, boy, this is really, really nice. and smells so good. Well, you know, the problem with that is it doesn't last. Uh, you spend your money for an automobile, and it smells so good for a few days anyway. And after a while, that newness begins to wear off. And if you've had Dodge products like me, they've never lasted very long anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that, Frank. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, the newness eventually wears off. Not only the smell, but it has things wrong with it. And so it begins to wear out, and you take it back to the dealership, and you get it repaired. And he says, well, that'll be, uh, you know, $150, $250, $300, $400 to get it repaired. And so you think you've got it fixed, and then you run it a while, and you take it back and have to get it fixed again. Seems like there's always something to keep up on. Well, it was new, but now it's old. And eventually, it will end up in the rust heap, the junk pile. So the Bible says, we're not to lay out for ourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt or destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. I knew a man one time that stayed away from services to protect his uh, property. He sat out on the uh, back porch of his house with a shotgun, afraid somebody was going to come in and steal uh, items in his house. Maybe I was a little more plain than I should have been, but I told him it seemed to me like his treasures were laid up on the earth and not in heaven. Because you see, when we put these treasures upon the earth before the treasures in heaven, we're misguided, we're misdirected. Our affections are not in the right place. And so if we in life try to uh, indicate to our children that these things are more important than heaven, then we've gone awry. We've missed the mark entirely because these things are going to vanish and disappear and decay. Well, earth is not going to last. It's insecure. We're living in an age of fear and insecurity of every kind. Isn't it wonderful to be able to talk about a place that we can know is real, that is prepared for a prepared people, and have the faith and the confidence that we are going to heaven, that we're going to reach our destiny. There is a song, I think it's in this psalm book, that has this phrase, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You see, we are just pilgrims and strangers in our journey through life. And this earth, with all of its sorrows and heartaches, is going to vanish away. But 
But the Lord said, My words shall not pass away. Well, Jesus used phrases during his personal ministry to prove that heaven is a place. For instance, in Matthew 6 and verses 9 and 14, we, of course, are to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. And then the verse says, your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is, if we forgive those who sin against us, our heavenly Father will also forgive us. In Mark 13, verse 25, and the stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. In Mark 13 and verse 32, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven neither the Son, but the Father. In John 6 and verses 31 and 32, Jesus talked about the bread that God was going to give from heaven versus the manna that Moses gave. And so there is the eating of that bread of life. There is that partaking of the bread of life, which is from heaven. And then in Luke 15, this is a story that all of you are acquainted with, the prodigal son. He went into a far country. He wasted his substance in riotous living. He found himself in the hog pen. You remember what he did? He finally came to himself and said, I am going to arise and I'm going to go back to my father. And then you'll notice an important phrase in there. He says, I have sinned against heaven, against heaven and before thee. Isn't it interesting that sometimes in life, we think that when we commit sin that God does not take notice? That we can somehow hide it or get by with it? But you see, the prodigal, when he came to himself, finally realized, I have sinned against thee and against heaven and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But let me be as one of your hired servants. You see, if we're going to prepare ourselves and fit ourselves for heaven, then we need to understand the obligations that are before us. To some of the ancient saints, the Father's home was a heavenly country of which God is the heavenly Father. This past week, while in the meeting, we were able to tour some of the Amish country. Many of you have been able to do that, especially at this time of the year with the leaves and their vibrant colors changing. It's a marvelous thing to behold. I told Brother Newell as we were traveling the other day, it's just hard for us to even begin to comprehend the beauties of heaven. When we think of the splendor of the grass and the changing of the leaves on the trees and all the vegetation and all its various forms, how can we begin to even describe what heaven is going to be like? It just boggles the, the mind, doesn't it? But you know, the writer of the Hebrews, as Brother Varner so eloquently talked about uh, yesterday, indicates that there were the ancients who desired a better country. I don't know about you, but at times in life I'm tired of this life with its disappointments and its discouragements in life. We get tired. Do you ever get tired? and wearisome with things that happen to us in this life. And so the writer says we look for a better country. To those of old, they look forward to a place that was a better country. And then it says that is an heavenly. It's a heavenly country. Something unique and different for which we all long. Something better. It's a better country. Uh, years ago, when the hippie movement was prevalent, some of you won't remember that, but when the hippie movement was prevalent, there was a bumper sticker that was common, and individuals would put that on their car, and it went something like this, love America or leave it. You remember that? When we think of a better country, we're going to leave this one. And we're going to a better country. And he says it is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed 
to be called their God. Do you think that in life God is sometimes ashamed of us? Sure he is. Because we neglect to do what we're supposed to do. But we desire a better country. Therefore, I'm going to try to be a better person. Because God is my Heavenly Father. He wants to be called our God. For he has prepared, notice, for them a city. It's unique when we look at all of the expansion around us. When I was getting ready to move from Chillicothe, in the last few years we've had all kinds of expansion, all kinds of new buildings uh, being erected. And someone predicted that in the area where our church building was located, that by the year 2000, that section of our city is going to be double the size of Chillicothe itself. And I just could not, I just could not imagine that. 30,000 in that city already, 60,000 in the county, and one church of our Lord. And they said by the year 2000, that section of the town was going to be double the size of the town itself. And so when we look at all of these new things and all of the expansion, man seemingly is interested in all of these material things, but all of these things are going to vanish and decay. But a wonderful nature of our ultimate presence in heaven will be the fact, and I want you to take notice of this, that Jesus wants us to be there. My grandmothers and grandfathers, well, even my mother and father throughout life, always tried to encourage me to have the desire of going to heaven. There's nothing, I don't think, in this world that encourages me anymore than for my parents to say to me, we want you to go to heaven. Does that make your children feel better when you tell them you want them to go to heaven? Jesus wants us to go to heaven. To me, that's a, a tremendous thought. When you look at all the things, John 17 and verse 24 says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. David, when he lost Absalom, you remember that? When he lost Absalom. Said he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. Those in our lives who have gone before us, I want to be with my Heavenly Father, but I also want to be with my loved ones. And I cherish that. More than anything else in life, I've tried to indicate to my boys, I want them to Regardless of what else happens in life, I want them to go to heaven. I desire that they go to heaven. And I want you to go to heaven. Or I wouldn't be preaching this lesson this morning. And I'm sure all of these other preachers feel the same way. The precious thoughts that were uppermost in the mind of Paul are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this by inspiration. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, he says, we are always confident. Did you ever notice how many times Paul and other inspired writers talked about the confidence that we're to have when we talk about the journey of going to heaven? The confidence that we're to have in our Lord guiding us and directing us? Knowing that whilst we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Do we long for the time when we can be with the Lord and see Him face to face. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Jesus said, 
by the authority of his heavenly Father. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14, 2. Heaven is a new order made ready for those who have prepared for it. And I'm afraid that many people are not making adequate preparation. Jesus will return to receive his own in that glorious abode prepared by the Father from the foundation of the world. And so we need to prepare ourselves by obeying the gospel of Jesus, by hearing the glorious gospel and obeying it before it's eternally too late, and preaching the gospel to our lost and dying friends. And then thirdly this morning, we notice that Jesus taught what constitutes heaven. If we could just begin to describe the joy of heaven. Have you ever had a time in your life when you just fell on top of the world, that, you know, you were just so happy and joy filled your life that you just couldn't hardly put it into words. Heaven is going to be a place of lasting and eternal joy, of purest joy. There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. One individual is so important to our Heavenly Father. There is joy in heaven. When you think of all the redeemed of all the ages, it provides for us, secondly, an ever wider service. There are going to be rewards for our being faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, verse 12 says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Jesus said that there are going to be rewards for those who are going to be faithful. Those who are faithful not only receive rewards eternally, but I believe we receive blessings and rewards now. For instance, isn't it marvelous that no matter where we go, we find friends, those of like precious faith, that are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can share in the joy and the fellowship that we have with each other. And we can serve them. And there are rewards in that. There are benefits and blessings. But one of the ones that I always keep in the front of my mind is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 4. If you don't remember anything else, just try to remember this one. And that is that no one, no one can take this reward from me. The Bible says it is an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven for me. It's undefiled. It does not fade away. It is an inheritance incorruptible. It's not going to be that which is temporary. You talk about inheritances, Someone dies and leaves someone an inheritance. Somebody can come along and contest it. Take it away. It's no longer theirs. But this reward, the blessing and the opportunity and the joys of heaven, is not going to fade away. It's incorruptible. It's reserved in heaven for me. But we need to use our talents and use our abilities to the honor and the glory of God. It is, of course, for select occupants of the earth and by that I mean the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus spoke about heaven, and he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. That's the only way that we have of getting to heaven. Let me close this morning with another thought. And that is the rewards of heaven are given to those that overcome. And Brother Dobbs mentioned the book of Revelation and that's where I want to finish this morning. In Revelation chapter 2 beginning there are seven seven blessings or rewards for those who overcome. Let's look at these very briefly. Revelation chapter 2, we'll start. Verse 7. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Our Lord also taught that if we are faithful in a few things, he will make us ruler over many things. To the one that overcometh. Chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Isn't that what Matthew 10, 32, and 33 teaches? He will acknowledge or confess us before his heavenly Father, but if we deny him, he will deny us. Verse 12, He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, the source, and I will write upon him my new name. And then finally, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with, with me in my throne. That would be marvelous. To rule and to reign with Jesus. To sit with him on the throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Just as I have overcome he says, you can overcome as well. Enter ye in at the straight gate. The word straight means it's going to be difficult. It's going to pinch. And there is another passage in Luke 13 and verse 24 which indicates to us we are to strive to enter in. And our Lord taught intently that what is involved here is that it's going to take some effort to enter into the straight gate. And people think it's going to be easy, but it's not. It's going to be difficult. And our Lord, I believe, intended for us to know that. It's going to be a difficult and a narrow way as we enter into it. We're going to have to give up our sinful pleasures and desires and the ways of the world to enter into the straight gate. It's going to be difficult. But we can make it. And we can overcome just as our Lord did.